Okay, Mark, I gotta get this right. <laughs> if you were a food, what would you be and why? Um, it's gotta be chocolate. Um, oh, and actually, I was just at the event um, on Friday, and they said the nicest sultry net and the sweetest guy in Orange County. So, oh. For people who aren't familiar with the food bank, if you don't mind, I'll start with that. And, and the food bank is part of this larger charity, the Community Action Partnership of Orange County. Uh, we distributed over 22 million pounds of food last year. Wow. Absolutely. Uh, helping on average. And that food was able to help feed an average of 150,000 different people each month with the help of 18,000 different volunteers and thousands of additional food and financial donors. And we get food donated from the food industry, from manufacturers and wholesalers and retailers and distributors, uh, from local farmers, we receive government surplus commodities, and food from food drives that are put on by churches, service clubs and organizations, schools and companies. And then we do two things with that food. The first is that we supply other nonprofits in Orange County. So there are 375 Orange County charities that come to our Garden Grove warehouse to get food that they take back and distribute to vulnerable people in their communities. And those organizations include churches and soup kitchens, shelters, community centers, senior centers, family resource centers, and other charities that are involved in helping feed people. Now, we've always done a really good job at counting how many people get help with food that comes from our food bank. We haven't always done, always done a good job knowing who isn't able to get help because we don't have enough food. So some researchers um, did some research and, and called it mapping the meal gap. And they went into major communities and tried to measure the number of people who are poor and hungry. As part of our five years of plan recently passed, we picked some bold goals in terms of increasing the amount of food available to try to not completely close that meal gap in five years, but take a really dramatic step to try to do that. And then I'll share my food story. Uh, and my favorite food story all revolves around the holidays, and that's probably not surprising for a lot of you. Uh, but Thanksgiving at our house was always the place where family gathered. So grandparents, maternal, paternal, aunts and uncles, cousins would all gather at my parents' house. And we'd have the cornucopia of food on our dining room table. We would all eat in excess. And then everybody that likes sports would gather in the family room and watch the games. All the non-sports people would gather in the living room and watch the Twilight Zone marathon. <laughs> I was in that room. Um, and I would lie on the floor and moan and groan and enjoy every moment of it. And then everybody would gather back at Christmas time. Um, but my favorite food story really revolves around Christmas morning because it was then that my maternal grandmother, Grandma Lowry, uh, would show up. And her car was full of all the goods that she spent the last few weeks baking. And Grandma Lowry grew up on the farm in Oklahoma, and she baked like nobody else. And we would all excitedly run out to her car, and it was full of these little tins with kind of old-fashioned country scenes you know, on them. And we would start bringing all that stuff in. The pecan pie, the pumpkin pie, the fruit cake that actually tasted good. <laughs> Which is almost an oxymoron, but it was tasty. Um, we had the shortbread cookies and the, ch the chocolate chip cookies. We had fudge with and without walnuts. We had forgotten cookies, Hello Dolly cookies, and, and a bunch of others whose names I can't remember, but you know, loved each and one of them nonetheless. And we would stack all of those in the laundry room, and then we'd all open our Christmas presents, and then it was our job to start opening up all those tins and start stationing those desserts in all of our three-story dessert trays. And then from that moment forward, for about a month, um, we would enjoy every bite of those delicious goodies that my grandmother made. So, you know, those are still treasured memories for me. All of those tins filled with all of that love and all of those desserts that my grandmother had spent so much time making for us. And now we look forward to the holidays. The first one coming up, of course, is Thanksgiving. And like a lot of you, there's probably two pictures that I grew up with. You know, the first is the Native Americans sharing that first bounty with the new arrivals to this country, the Pilgrims. And somehow, I think in there, we, got, we kind of missed the point. You know, for me and many others, Thanksgiving has now become synonymous with gluttony. Right? We eat all we possibly can and then lay on the ground, moan and groan, and watch the Twilight Zone marathon. <laughs> but that was really not about gluttony, but really about sharing our bounty with the new arrival. 
with a person that didn't have enough. And we want to make sure that the true reason for Thanksgiving isn't lost in our culture today. And, and the other picture that I grew up with was that Norman, Norman Rockwell portrayal of Thanksgiving. Right? It was the mom with the apron on, the dad leaning over the plump turkey, turkey with the carving knife, and the excited kids around that dining room table. And those were both strong images for me growing up, and I think for a lot of people. And, and I know for me that Norman Rockwell Thanksgiving really came true. My parents were able to deliver on that promise for me and my family. And I'm a different and better person today for those experiences. But I know, too, that there's probably no guilt that can weigh more heavily on a parent than the inability to meet the needs of their children or deliver on the promise like that Norman Rockwell portrait. And some of our customers may not have a stable home or a dining room table around which to gather or certainly the foods that I enjoyed you know, during the holidays. So when we talk about delivering food to people, it's just not to meet their physical needs for food, but it's to meet people with empathy in often difficult moments in their lives and try to relieve them from those burdens, those, that guilt, that pain. Because in much the same way, those wonderful childhood memories that I had of my Thanksgiving and Christmas and continued through adolescence and adulthood shaped me in a positive and uplifting way. You know, those experiences of not having enough can every be, bit, every bit is life-shaping in a way that is destructive and painful and scarring both for parent and child alike. So our hope for the holidays is to remove that risk of pain and anxiety and depression and scarring and make sure that we're able to replace that and provide people an opportunity to have the same sort of holiday experience, food and meals and memories you know, that, that I've had. So as a result of my upbringing, I love the holidays. And, and I have hope for the holidays, and I hope you do too.